up Giants fans, hub watchers, YouTube subscribers, Twitter and Instagram followers. It's Kush back at it again with another pros and cons video from the New York Giants 2020 season. Of course, the Giants faced the Rams this past Sunday at SoFi Stadium, that beautiful, beautiful stadium, which is unfortunate that people couldn't pack it and fill it with the noise that it truly deserves. But the Giants faced the Rams. They lost in a 9-17 battle. Well, it was a really, really close game up until, like, I want to say maybe 8-7 minutes left in the fourth quarter when Cooper Cup scored that long touchdown, 55-yard touchdown for the Rams. Whatever the case may be, it was a way better game than everybody, including myself, expected, especially from the Giants. Um, I think a lot of us expected them to get blown out coming off of that loss against the 49ers where it was 36-9. And our offense, as has been the case since week one, essentially didn't look like they couldn't do anything. And we expected much of the same for week four here against the Rams. And that was not the case. It really wasn't. You know, thinking about it right now, honestly... I probably have more pros than cons. It was just such an improved game from last week, you know, from week three, that it's like, I can't help but, you know, have a little bit of an upbeat attitude about it. So that being said, let's get into it. I think I'm gonna cover all of the cons first. And then, so in terms of the first con right here, I think defensively, I'm trying to think, and nothing's really coming to mind except for that Cooper Cup play. So I guess I'll put that as a con because that kind of did cost us the game a little bit. So the Cooper Cup um, play where it was just, I don't know what James Bradbury was doing in that play. He seemed to be up in a sort of single high safety type of look. But of course, we all know Bradbury is our number one corner. So maybe he was just in some type of zone coverage. And I don't know, whatever the case was, he did not make a time. You know, he did not make a timely decision to go and tackle or, you know, to just go towards Cooper in time. Cooper got past them, of course, got the touchdown. There was no true safety out there. You guys know I don't have all 22 film. I don't have access to that. You know, I'm not an NFL Game Pass member. So, I mean, I can't go back and look at the film and definitely tell you there was no safety out there and whatnot. From what I remember, there wasn't. And I hope Patrick Graham would never call that play again because every other play that he called that game was absolutely perfect, which I'll get into, of course. But there's that one play that's definitely a con. The other con that immediately comes to mind, um, you know, now we're switching over to the offensive end here would obviously be Daniel Jones's interception for all the good that he did. And I will get into that in the pros. His interception at the end of the game was killer, costly, stupid, a mistake. And I said last week, I'm done with defending boneheaded decisions. This wasn't necessarily a boneheaded decision. This was more so just of a bad decision. The guy had a completely open running lane where he could potentially gone a touchdown. But realistically speaking, he would definitely gone the first down. That was the thing too. I don't think it was like a first and goal or second and goal type of situation. It was definitely, you know, a first down, second down type of situation where you didn't necessarily need to get into the end zone. And he made a throw. Um, I can't remember who he was targeting, but that cornerback made a great play as well. They sort of just jumped in front of the ball and got a nice interception, a nice pick off of it. But you can't force a ball down there, Daniel, and that's exactly what it looked like. It looked like he was forcing the ball down there, made good decisions up until that point, and he failed to come up in the clutch when it mattered most. So that's another con. Um, one other thing, of course, as usual, Jason Garrett's play calling makes the list again for the fourth week in a row his play calling has been a con for me for every single week that the giants have played so far if it's any consolation his play calling was better this week than it was last week then again a lot of things were better this week than it was last week i actually said last week the only con was that you know that game against the 49ers was rock bottom so you could only move up from there but jason garrett and his play calling continues to make me think that literally anybody else can do a better job i will say this you know the run game got going and helped them a little bit but the pass plays you know the, the plays he was calling on the passing offense still a little too simple still a little too vanilla he once again only take maybe i want to say maybe two or three deep shots the entire game one of them paid off the one to darius slayton um but jason gare and his play calling i will say this it looks like he's slowly opening up the playbook and i'll say this for the rest of the video as well this technically finishes what would have been the preseason for the Giants. You know, they now have four legitimate games on the books. And I think that they are going to, you know, genuinely improve this point going forward. And once again, another thing that's on here, the offensive line, which I feel like has been a con for, if not every four weeks, maybe three to four weeks. But 
they've been hot and cold today or i say today as in the games against the rams they were hot and cold you know what i'm saying there was times where they like just crumpled like a wet paper bag and they couldn't do anything against um the rams and there were times where they held up you know they held up in times um like for example when matt Pierre came in and that one drive before the halftime came along the offensive line looked perfect they looked like they didn't let anybody through they were getting run blocking lanes and they were protecting daniel jones but there were a lot of times where they crumpled and had it not been for jones you know quick on his feet on the last drive that last drive would have ended a lot sooner than that pick because there was like two or three plays where he looked like he was going to get sacked and he got out immediately so the offensive line hot and cold once again slowly improving though and i gotta say nick gates by himself makes the list for me Maybe I'm a little too harsh on Nick Gates, but I did not like his performance today at all. I haven't liked any performance by him so far. I know a lot of people are out here spinning the tail that, oh, he handled Aaron, Do Aaron Donald, which isn't necessarily true. I mean, Donald was, for the most part, on Kevin Zeitler for like 90% of the day, and even then Zeitler was help. You know, he was double teaming him. I don't think Nick Gates was ever one-on-one -on -one with him, and I think people are saying that because, you know, he sort of picked a fight with Donald a little bit during the game, which, you know, the attitude I like. But he had way too many high snaps for my liking. He still has a lot to show me before I trust him as our, you know, actual center going forward and not just a placeholder. But Nick Gates makes the list for me specifically because of those high snaps. Can't be doing that during the game, man. Wide receivers, tight ends, you name it, receiver weapons, they make the cons list as well. They dropped a lot of balls today. Darius Slayton dropped a lot of balls today. He didn't get that many looks. But at the same time, with the looks that he did get, you didn't take the opportunity. Um... You already know Evan Ingram would have his drop. I'm pretty sure Caden Smith had a drop. I know for sure Damian Ratley had a drop. I can't think of any receiver on this team that didn't have a drop. Maybe Devontae Freeman, you know, the running back, of course, when he was in the receiving game, I think he, he caught all his balls and whatnot. But every receiver had a drop, and it really showed how weak this core is right now. And, and it's sad. Golden Tate, who's still technically recovering from injury because, you know, off of his first catch, he slid down, took the business decision. You know he's recovering from injury. He's not at full strength. He's not even there fully mentally. You know, he got into the fight with Ramsey afterwards, which I'm going to put down as a con as well. We have no idea how that's going to affect, you know, him or the Giants team. I was telling Kid Blue on stream, somebody, we just lost somebody there. We didn't know who was involved in the fight, but I was like, whoever it is, we just lost them to a suspension or something, or maybe even we're going to trade them away or whatnot. I mean, you could look at it however you want to look at it. Like, we don't need Golden Tate or we should have gotten rid of Golden Tate. Whatever the case is, he himself makes the cons list as well. And with that being said, let me switch over to the pros, Um, which I do have a good amount of pros here. You know, first up, let's talk about Daniel Jones. He's, he did make the cons list as well as the pros list. I'm not the only player to do that this week. Daniel Jones, literally other than the last play, had a near perfect game. You know what I'm saying? This dude was keeping the offense alive. For the most part, he was the only thing and the only reason the offense was moving out there. You know what I mean? I, I mentioned before, you know, quick thinking on the feet in the last drive, but throughout the entire game, despite his re receiving weapons not being receiving weapons, despite his offensive line failing him more often than not, and despite the run game not getting going until basically the second half, he was the only reason the offense was in there. So Daniel Jones does make the list. Continues to show improvement in certain areas that he cannot capitalize in the red zone. I'll tell you what, he's a bad red zone quarterback for sure. Um, another person that makes the list here would be Wayne Gallman, Devontae Freeman, Deion Lewis. Just the running back core today because I'm going to give them props. They finally got the run game going, and this is where I said the offensive line was hot and cold. I'm not necessarily going to put them on the pro line, but I'll, I'll, you know, they could take, you know, some of this, you know, right here with the running back core because the run game did get going today. It took a while, but once it got going, it actually looked fairly consistent. I think finally the Giants had a game where we had over 100 yards rushing, and it definitely helped out the offense it, it opened up the playbook a little bit too and i hope that this could transfer into next week so that it would help out jason garrett's play calling and whatnot gallman had a nice gash of like a 25 26 yard run um but the most consistent run today was definitely Devonte freeman once again his stats you know he shows that he averages three yards a carry doesn't really reflect how he actually ran today he got a lot of dirty yards he was running very hard very consistent i love it Another person that makes the list here, Patrick Graham, now switching over to the defensive side again. Patrick Graham and Joe Judge, for that matter, they have made the best Giants defense in years, since 2016. And I think a lot of Giants fans can acknowledge that 2016 defense performed way better than it was. But this is the best Giants defense in years that we have seen. It's into week four now. 
and it seems like week three was just an aberration it seems like week three i don't know maybe they were off their stuff or something but they were not performing how they did in week one and week two and here we are in week four you're holding down the rams offense top 10 offense in the league top seven passing top three rushing top three rushing offense our defense held them to less than 100 yards rushing i think passing or something like that the rams average coming into the game like 350 yards passing a crazy number like that we held them to 200 yards passing scoring the rams were averaging around 30 points a game we held them to 17 points this game this defense is quite frankly amazing and a lot of credit goes to patrick graham and a good amount of credit goes to Joe Judge as well. You know he was involved heavily in making this defense, constructing who was on here, because I'm gonna throw two other guys on there right now, James Bradbury, Blake Martinez. It's not like they had a standout play per se, but they were just consistently good today and their leadership showed. And as of week four, they're both top 10 at their position. They're, they're legitimately top 10 players at their position. We have them on the Giants in their primes. This defense, I, I can't simply say enough about it, man. I'm so proud of them. They, You know what? You could take away that touchdown. We really held them to 10 points, but it, it is on there. That was one blown play. And like I said, I don't expect Patrick Graham to be calling any other time soon, but I'm surprised by what we have here in the Giants defense. Um, Last time I checked, and in fact, let me check right now again. The defensive rankings are... Jesus Christ, they're amazing. We're the 13th overall defense in the NFL, 8th overall pass defense, 11th overall rushing defense. That is amazing, especially on the rushing defense. Last week, we were the 24th overall rushing defense, so that just shows you how good of a game that we had against the Rams, man. The defense, that's not even at full strength. We're missing Xavier McKinney. We're missing Jabril Peppers, our two starting safeties. We're missing Julian Love, who was a great rotational player. You could consider him a starter. And we don't even have a legitimate middle linebacker next to Blake Martinez. Although this one person who does make the pros list as well, Tay Crowder, he had a nice, not necessarily debut today, but a nice couple of snaps today. He definitely showed his stuff, almost got an interception. Tay Crowder had a really good game today, as well as Ryan Lewis, the cornerback that we got from the Raiders, I believe. I thought he was going to look like a scrub because he never heard the guy before. He was basically on the practice squad of the Raiders. Looked like a good number two cornerback out there whenever he was used. So those two guys make the list as well. Another person that makes the list, Kyler Fackrell, got a sack today, was generally involved in everything. He um, was second in team in tackles. Of course, Blake Martinez loves Kyler Fackrell, came in second with four tackles. He actually left the game for a while. It would seem with a neck injury, but he came back in and did well. Dexter Lawrence, you could put him on the list. Like literally everybody on this defense, you could put on the list. And I just can't say enough of how proud I am of the team to have such a good comeback type of game. After being embarrassed by the 49ers, you come back, you don't look competent, you look competitive. You look like you could have beaten the Rams, who are looking like one of the best teams in the NFC once again. This Giants team looked good on Sunday, and I can't say that enough. There's so many good things to take out from here. I'm pretty sure I left some things out by, you know, maybe my mind is just not coming to them right now. But the Giants team looked good. The defense looks amazing. The offense has a long way to go. But it's getting there now that we have the run game going. Hopefully, it could transfer over. Daniel Jones is improving, yet he's not finishing, if that makes any sense. He has a way to go as well. But this team, this is what I want to see progression, and I like it, man. Put your thoughts down below. Let me know what you guys think. What are some pros and cons you came up with yourself? That's it for now, and I'm out. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. I'll catch y'all in the next one.